Welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. My name is Kristen Norton. I'm with Green Room Technologies as the Chief Science Officer and Lead uh, Biz Dev. But today I'm here with our partner, BlockCube, uh, and their CEO, Rama Rao, to host a speaker series called Next Generation Technology for Today's Clinical Trials. So to, get, to begin with, I'd like for Rama, who is the CEO and founder of BlockCube and the sponsor of this event, to give us a, just a moment's background on himself and on why he developed BlockCube to answer the challenges faced by today's decentralized trials. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my background in Lilly and Novartis, two of the leading pharma companies, had given me an insight into some of the challenges in the clinical trial processes. And having spent the time in multiple assignments uh, in both companies and in multiple countries, uh, I had a clearer picture of some of the strategic operational tactical challenges. And recognizing that drug development takes a lot of time, I felt the time was right to come up with an innovative solution. And this innovative solution has been developed with the help of a very seasoned team of leaders in this domain to demonstrably deliver time and resource efficiencies, uh, allow remote monitoring, allow real-time data, something that the pandemic has highlighted and at the same time, uh, you know, see that the governance pieces come together. The objective of it is to give, say, life science, biotech, CROs, basically a very robust tool for managing their business operations, whether it's accelerating clinical trials, paying sites faster, or for that matter, accelerating revenue in the time periods that we are living in. And I really appreciate all of you joining us for this webinar. The fact of the matter is that uh, COVID has affected everybody and even in the area of trials and almost 78% of new trials have been impacted by it. Uh, the industry has taken a good leadership role through the Decentralized Clinical Trials Initiative and other consortia to make lasting change. And as the webinar, uh, uh, you know, Christine had said, if we don't make the change now, when else will we do it? And with that, let me transfer it back to Christine. Wonderful, thank you, Rama. Um, we appreciate your introduction and sponsoring this event to bring these experts together. I'll now let each of them introduce themselves and tell a little bit about their, their background and what their current co company and role is related to clinical trial management. Stephanie, can you get started? Sure, happy to, Kristen. Hello, everyone. Stephanie Cooner. I work at Bristol Myers Squibb as part of the Strategic Sourcing and Procurement Organization, uh, specializing in business partnering and strategy. And my remit so is supporting um, not only the innovation work that we're doing here at BMS, but also clinical technology and patient recruitment. I also am a board member of DTRA, Decentralized Trials and Research Alliance. And prior to joining BMS, I uh, spent about 20 years within patient recruitment and engagement, as well as clinical technology. Wonderful, thank you. All right, next, Alex. Hi, hi everyone. It's a pleasure to, to be here from uh, what seems like a sunny New York. Uh, for this uh, conversation, I wear the hats of an advisor for Ada Labs in Africa, which is a fusion lab that is a tech hub for smart technologies based in Nairobi, Kenya, and also serve as a expert in healthcare and blockchain and in general decentralized technologies for the United Nations. Um, I've been practicing medicine for close to 30 years, I've been involved in uh, technology integration into the clinical workflow for, I don't know, 15, and specifically in uh, Web 3.0 technologies, I would say, uh, since uh, 2013, 14. 
Um, I, uh, uh, in relation to, to clinical trials, work with the uh, uh, European Union on the GDPR group, with the United Nations on the SDG group, and um, help uh, African uh, countries leapfrog as they uh, digitize their healthcare systems into technologies that I hope we'll all embrace. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Alex. We sure appreciate you having you here and especially the, the global perspective that you bring. All right, Gabe. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Gabe Goldfeder. I'm the Director of Clinical Operations for the Global Alzheimer's Platform. Um, we are a nonprofit uh, with a mission of accelerating clinical trials within Alzheimer's. And actually, it's a good day because we are actually in the New York Times today. So I don't know if you read the article, but our president was quoted about a new Alzheimer's trial. Uh, but basically, we oversee a consortium of 80 research centers and along with our pharma partners, try to help those centers accelerate their research. And then we'll talk more about that as the afternoon goes on, but it's great to be here, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, and finally, we have Kevin Coker. Yeah, hi, good afternoon, everyone. Kevin Coker, um, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Proxima Clinical Research, based out of, of Houston, Texas. Um, and uh, my company provides clinical and regulatory services, uh, mostly to emerging biotech and, and med tech companies. Uh, I was trained uh, scientifically uh, uh, as a molecular pathologist. That was quite some time ago. I've uh, been in clinical research for almost 20 years. I've worked for um, uh, Big Pharma, uh, if you will, or worked for organizations that worked for Big Pharma for a long time. Uh, I worked at an at academic institution, uh, managing a phase one center, then worked for um, an oncology group for a long time, working on uh, large phase three oncology trials uh, for folks like uh, BMS, Eli Lilly, uh, Novartis, um, all the, the groups that are represented uh, here today. Um, uh, and uh, uh, started this company about three years ago and um, uh, been working with mostly emerging companies and trying to help them overcome uh, problems and, and, and helping them get their products to market. Uh, very happy to be here today and, and looking forward to the conversation. Wonderful, thank you. So now that we have a little bit of background on the team, I thought we might start by going around and asking um, each of you to talk a little bit in general about how catalyst, how COVID has been a catalyst for change um, within your organization and your specific role. So we'll start again at the top with you, Stephanie. All right, sure, happy to. So interestingly enough, I actually started with BMS um, right at the beginning of COVID, or at least in the beginning of COVID in the US. So I ne didn't necessarily have a lens into pre-COVID BMS by any means, but uh, based on you know, what I've heard from colleagues and input, um, it has changed. And, and I know it's changed also for the industry um, and even many of the partners that we're working with today to help us continue, well, first with business continuity, but um, continuing forward as well and moving forward. It's, it's changed how we're, we're interacting. And what I mean by that is many, many of our trials were delayed, um, some stopped, some halted. And um, you know, the team that I, I run here within clinical technology was, was very critical in trying to make sure that we could maintain that business continuity in such a critical time. You know, at, the, at the end of the day, we cannot stop getting medication into patients' hands. So um, you know, keeping that in mind, you know, our, our business model has evolved and now BMS as a whole has made a very large investment in ensuring that we don't go back. We need to maintain that momentum and it's important for all parties involved um, our, and most importantly, our patients too. The, thought, the idea that we have now the option to bring the trial to the patient opens up in a whole nother world for clinical research and, and the work that we have ahead of us. Wonderful. Uh, okay, um, uh, Gabe, do you want to uh, expand on that, what you've seen? Uh, sh sure. So, you know, for our organization, because of what we do is in helping research sites. So our company itself, you know, wasn't greatly impacted from COVID in the sense that we're already a 
a virtual company, right? We have a you know PO box equivalent office in, in DC, but we were all virtual anyway. But the real hit, and what we really had to scramble and pivot was to how do we help our sites who some you know were in danger of going out of business, uh, you know, because uh, trials just stop, patients can't come in, you can't recruit if you're a, if you're a research site and you can't recruit put patients in, your revenues are going to go down and you're going to disappear. So sites that didn't have any other business, like some sites are just freestanding research sites, were really in danger. So we had to figure out ways to help our sites weather the storm and at the same time find solutions that in the future it shouldn't be so disruptive. Uh, and that's where you know we're really seeing now that for the long term, you know, technologies such as this and other types of technologies will be necessary that we can allow our trials to continue, even if we all have to be virtual or at least you know a good amount of us have to be virtual. And did your association see this coming before COVID actually hit? Or were you already moving towards some of these new technologies or new processes before? I mean, we're definitely, we're definitely moving to, to, because there's a new, you know, there's a big buzzword in the industry anyway, the past couple of years have been patient centricity. Yes. And because of patient centricity, you're already looking at ways to keep the patient at home, stop having them come in all the time. So there definitely was a push for it. But obviously not, you know, this put us light years uh, ahead of where we were before. Just, you know, it was conceptualizing it, trying a couple of pilots, but to really invest and, and try to go forward, this really propelled us. Interesting. Well, I'm glad that, that you have an organization there that can help others that are going through it. Um, Alex, how about you weigh in on what you've seen at a global level? Well, you know, in, in what, what pertains to changes in COVID, people would say, thought that I would say, oh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm working remote and I'm not eating out. But uh, <laughs> basically the, the huge change was more of, oh, all these things you've been working in the last five, six years, maybe we should start to pay attention to it. And if anything, COVID has shown the frailty of our systems, both from a operational perspective and both from a macroeconomic perspective. Uh, the systems are not broken the systems are working exactly how they are designed. Mm. Problem is that they're not designed to deal with a uh, world uh, biological pandemic. Uh, and so uh, we find out that we, all our data are in silos, they're inactionable. And so we ask questions that seem easy, like how much toilet paper do we need or how much hand sanitizer? do we need but these are very hard questions that require a lot of information and data liquidity and we don't have a business model that will incentivize or will create a frictionless environment for these data liquidity and so the questions become too hard the answers are not available ever if definitely not in real time and they become too expensive because we have all these privacy issues that require scrubbing of that information so the decentralized uh, 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 technologies in all its shape and forms that we will talk later in the conversation, like distributed ledger technology, like federated learning, actually offers a technological, uh, um, I would say, evolution to what COVID has uh, given to us in a sense where we understand that these technologies are security or hack resistant, they are censorship resistant, they are collusion resistant, and that's what we want at the end of the day. We just simply want our high fidelity, high integrity, uh, 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 in real time information that we can rely on and after that apply whatever business analytics we need. So I think that COVID, if anything, leapfrogged us ahead um, 10 years, mm -hmm. and especially in emerging markets because they don't have to deal with all the you know, legacy systems and a, at times a hostile or at least backward uh, in time uh, regulatory environment. And so they can actually be a, a, a good testing environment to afterwards come back to more uh, emerged markets and see how to apply it. So as much as it's been on a personal level very hard, I think that with the physical distancing, we have you know some type of social uh, uh, solidarity that has brought us forward. Uh, it's funny, I, I, I draw analogies to the uh, electronic medical record market and, and it had a similar kind of sudden dog leg based on a regulatory push, but we did leapfrog some outdated technologies or should be moving away from silos. Um, another question for you, uh, take a critical eye and look at the US versus other governments, other areas in which you've, you've worked. How do you see our response versus other countries? <laughs> well, you know, uh, 
I, I like to quote uh, Winston Churchill, who said, you can always count on Americans to do the right thing after they tried everything else. So, <laughs> so um, I think that instead of um, opposing systems, you know, there are cultural differences, there are different uh, market conditions. I think that um, uh, uh, this is not a Hollywood story of good guys, bad guys. This is more like a Greek tragedy. Either we all win or we all lose. And I think that the sooner we um, enter in this idea of coepetition, in other words, collaborative competition, this is not a kumbaya, let's share all I, uh, IP with everyone around the, the campfire, but this is like to respect each and everyone's work, to respect uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the research and the IP that has been developed, but that we understand that it is a better business model. It increases the pie. If we move from a commodity economic mentality where there's a zero sum game that if I have more than you have less to a more digital economy, which is infinite. And therefore, we want that data to be liquid. We want that data to move frictionlessly. And we want also to include users. And I hope that we'll get to that point of where uh, uh, Gabe mentioned patient-centric. I agree. But how cool would it be if it would be patient-driven? And mm. so that we have 7.5 billion uh, uh, entrepreneurs that are... <laughs> Are part of this, uh, uh, you know, this economy that would really bring to a, a flourishing of, of the planet. Yeah, I like that. Okay, um, Kevin. So you are sort of the target audience for for this webinar, um, in that you're with a small size to mid size CRO. Um, can you give us your perspective on what really has changed for you guys day to day, um, and in and in your long term planning related to the new era? Yeah, sure. Um... Uh, you know, last year, from February to, to June, every metric that we were tracking was just flat. Um, uh, hospitals shut down, the trials that we had open were not enrolling. Um, the, the people that we were trying to help get uh, started, uh, their investors were not giving them money. Um, the whole world was, was frozen for the first half of the year. And then starting around uh, you know, June, we got a word from uh, at least MD Anderson, one of the hospitals that we were working with, that they had decided that they were going to open back up um, despite the fact that cases were as high as they had ever been last year. Um, they felt like they had a good handle and they, they knew that research had to continue. Um, and then shortly thereafter, we started getting other hospitals Baylor, Memorial Sloan Kettering, others, uh, not necessarily following suit or following suit, but um, uh, within a week, everything started to change. Uh, investors were starting to reinvest again. People could actually make decisions. And then the proverbial hockey stick started to happen where we started getting um, not only uh, new business, but um, uh, and, and things moving again, uh, but then the floodgates of all of the COVID uh, products, um, uh, regulatory submissions, and, uh, and then the trial work that needed to be conducted was flowing after the, uh, you know, soon thereafter. Um, so, you know, our industry has been uh, shamefully uh, recalcitrant in, in, in adopting technology. There's a lot of reasons for that. Um, you know, there's so many different stakeholders uh, that are part of this, hospitals and, you know, big pharma and, and small emerging companies and middlemen, CROs like myself, technology providers. Um, but there also wasn't a lot of incentive in providing technological solutions. Uh, you think about it, um, in a lot of ways, um, the incentive is in the delay. The longer it takes, um, a lot of companies can charge more for that, um, and, and they're charging on time and materials. So we've never really been faced with something like this to force us, like if we want to survive, we now have to uh, adopt technology. And we had to start doing that ourselves to, uh, um, to actually get these projects uh, uh, moving uh, internally, as well as start to, to um, uh, to utilize new processes and the way that we manage projects. 
And then we started seeing other organizations like IRBs and um, other groups also having to adopt that technology rather quickly to survive. Um, and so I think for us, you know, June to today, um, we've seen our company double um, every quarter uh, since June of last year. So we've, we've essentially uh, quadrupled in our size, um, number of projects. Um, you see programs like RADx now accelerating all of the projects for, for COVID. Um, the relationships that we have now with our companies and with our sites are very different than they were last year, than they were before. Um, because now we, we know that it's possible to utilize this technology to get things moving quicker. And so my hope is that we'll continue to do that and continue to adopt these new processes. And this will continue to drive, uh, drive these, these collaborations. Um, and we'll, we'll start to um, uh, maybe coalesce around, if, if it's not a unified platform, um, other platforms that speak to each other and that we can leverage this technology to, to move things forward much more quickly. Thank you. Yeah, that brings up something that I've been interested in um, and that I think I'd like uh, Gabe to weigh in on as well is you talk about collaboration and we've, we've talked about all the different players between sponsors, CROs, study sites and the patients now, we're, we're trying to drive a focus to the patients. How, so Gabe, can you weigh in on how you think this has changed relationships and how people, uh, you know, between those different parties work together? Uh, sure, so, let me, I, so quickly I would touch on, you know, the biggest change probably, at least that's occurring is between the site and the CRO and the sponsor. Uh, you have a lot more usage of these, you know, shared portals, these, uh, you know, investigator portals. So instead of having to have contact or, you know, any kind of physical contact, everything can be done virtually. Even though there was a move toward that before, I mean, these portals weren't just created, but as, you know, Kevin pointed out, just been a re reluctance to, to really adopt some of this stuff. And the electronic health record market is a perfect, you know, uh, a parallel to that in terms of, you know, taking, taking change very slowly. So right now what you have is a lot of change toward um, using those portals, using you know, risk-based monitoring, which again was something that was around, but now again, to try to limit how much the footprint, you know, how many times the CRA have to go to the site. Um, so that's certainly been curtailed uh, and, you know, and I think that'll be something that'll stay. Um, something else which, which they're developing is around, the, is around the patient and the site relationship. Because that's really the most danger, especially for us, we were doing Alzheimer's research it's a very vulnerable population to COVID. So these patients, if there's anything, you know, any risk, they're not coming in. You know, some of them did want to come in. You know, patients said, you know, I'd rather take a risk of, of getting COVID. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm you know, losing, you know, memory and stuff like that. But, but for the most part, obviously, it's a type of population because they're caregivers to come also. It's just not realistic for them to come in. So, you know, we, we have to really adopt. And what's going on now is they're trying to, you know, develop systems where we can do all the assessments we need to do remotely, which again was stuff that they worked on, but they have to validate all the scales, all the rating scales that we use, uh, validate all the other measures that we do to be done remotely, and then be able to, at the same time, incentivize the, the sites to do it this way. Because again, the sites, you know, in their financial interest, it's a little bit different because usually they get paid less for a virtual visit. So that's something that the pharma and CRO companies have to work out with, with the sites to make sure that they incentivize them to take this, to take this new system so that you know, the patients had a two, three months where they weren't even doing anything. But, but now, you know, as trials get designed, we have a new trial that we're starting up in, in uh, next year. It has, it already has built into it home infusions uh, that they can get this medicine at home, uh, which is, you know, again, it's been done sporadically on trials before, but to put it at the beginning of a trial that that's already an option is definitely because of COVID. And they're going to keep coming up with, with, with stuff like this. And, and um, you know, hopefully it'll, continue and you know again we we're not i'm not a user of the fancier technologies but i'm sure that that the adoption of these technologies will certainly help on the more practical side of everything that we do uh, on a more day-to-day -day basis stephanie you want to expand on that from a from a sponsor's point of view yes no i completely agree with everything you've said gabe um absolutely and i think you know one of the things um that obviously is a bonus of um, having more of a unified platform, which I know we're going to talk about today, is the idea of simplicity, right? So everyone has had um, an entire new way of 
um, of running clinical research almost thrown at them. <laughs> and so there is an adoption curve and, and everyone does need to relearn many aspects. Um, even the, the site staff and the CROs and the sponsor and the patient, so all parties involved. And I think an important thing, um, which I know we, I talked about a little bit in my introduction, um, is the efforts that DTRA is doing around this. So they're really pushing the industry to think differently and try to standardize um, and create a movement around this. And that's also working with regulators and setting policy around this. So there's many moving parts and many parties that are involved. And certainly um, I highly encourage anyone to get involved if they are, you know, are interested in helping to set that foundation for the future of, of remote trials and centralized trials. So organizations like you're involved in, is that a good way to get involved? With decentralized trials type organizations? Sorry, you were cutting out, but I, I think you. Are your organization? Oh no, I think it's my video. Sorry. <laughs> your organization is that's a good way to get involved? I think we lost it. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so certainly, um, you know, visiting DTRA.org and there's information about that to get involved and help push this forward. Wonderful. So. Um, in talking about um, a unified platform and the idea of, you know, everybody has multiple systems being able to be on one system, everybody can see the same data, you can see the same data across study sites if you have the right permissions, I think all that is just increasingly important, both, both for the user burnout, so you're not having to log into five different things, as well as just for the integrity of the study and the data, knowing that, that you can see what's happening across sites um, all at once, you know, if you have the appropriate roles. Um, uh, Alex, how is blockchain coming into that and into the data integrity and, and security? Um, can you speak a little bit more about emerging technologies um, that, that you've come across and, and that you help advise on? Sure. Um, you know, again, I, I don't know uh, um, what the audience knows about blockchain, but in general, when I speak about it, it's usually Bitcoin and making a lot of money, uh, and which is which is fine. I have I have nothing against that, but I think that um, the way I explain best um, blockchain is less about a technology, and more as a um, software solution to uh, the problem of trust. And, uh, you know, Gabe, I, I counted, mentioned six times the word incentives. And so the idea is that uh, um, this type of distributed database uh, basically ingrains in it almost like a game where there are incentives to be honest. And it, we call it, we call it trustless. So we don't need trust. Uh, right now we live in a world that if I want to transfer money, I have to transfer it through a person or a company that I need to trust. Now, I want to trust. I'm a very optimistic person. I, I like to believe in people, but it always turns out that on page 47 and font number three, uh, you know, there's something unfavorable there that is, 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 is not to my advantage. And so what basically this and anybody who worked on a database, they know if I do Google Doc or Google Sheets and I know that all of you are looking at it, then uh, I will be a little bit more pristine in how I put that information in there. And if there's a consensus and we agree at the end of the day that that's the result and we lock it using cryptography and we make sure that it can be auditable and time stamped and unhackable, then those blocks of information that are connected in a chain, hence the word blockchain, you know, makes it uh, 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 the type of pristine data that we're all looking for. Now, um, uh, there are multiple decentralized technologies, and it's wrong to think only of uh, distributed ledger technology as the, the only one. Um, for example, there are what we call privacy in-depth technologies things that have fancy words, but basically what they say is, I don't need to know the data in order to analyze it. 
which kind of makes your head spin. It's like, what do you mean? I don't need to know the data in order to analyze. In order to analyze it, I have to see your numbers. And there's technology that shows, no, that's not the case. And for example, one of them is called zero knowledge proof, where I can prove you that I know. So the way I like to explain it in a non-technical way is uh, everybody knows where's Waldo. So if I ask you, where's Waldo? And you go, Waldo's here, then you know everything about Waldo and nobody wants that. But if imagine on the book, I put a huge page. So I don't even know what the size of the book is. And there's a tiny little hole in it. And I just put it over the head of Waldo. And I say, here's Waldo. Then you know that I know where Waldo is, but you don't know anything else. So mm -hmm. I just want to share with the audience that there are a lot of things that uh, we can do. Distributed ledger technology, privacy and depth technologies that are both software and hardware and federated learning, for example, which is a type of machine learning, where the way I explain it is that right now, if you want to apply machine learning, uh, um, you have to either have in-house capabilities, which is a huge investment, or you need to send it somewhere, which is not only expensive, but in that transit, it could be uh, uh, hacked or vulnerable. So federated learning actually is a way of where instead of you going to the algorithm, the algorithm comes to you. So it's almost like a doctor's visit. So I go and I see what's going on in your house and then in Gabe's house and in Kevin's house and Rama and Stephanie. And my algorithm gets smarter and smarter without sharing with any one of you what's going on in each of your environment. So I think that uh, I want the audience to leave with the uh, uh, at least impression that without knowing the fancy names of these technologies and what they do, uh, what is homomorphic encryption, what is you know multi-party computation, and all these you know, verifiable computation. Instead of that, just to know that there are technologies out there that um, if we apply them, they can solve many of the problems that Kevin spoke to uh, that, 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 that can move forward the industry and what is holding us back is not even knowing about it. Because usually after people talk to me, they say, oh, wow, I didn't even know that that's, that exists. So now, now you know, and this is an opportunity to move forward. Thank you, that's a good explanation. And we did have some questions even prior to this about uh, what does all this mean? What's the regulatory implications of all of, all of all this new technology and new processes and and new patient safety focus? Um, would anybody like to speak to that? Well, I can just continue briefly into saying that just to paint the situation, regulation is always uh, decades behind where technology is. Anybody who watched uh, the big techs come to Congress and them you know, asking basic questions clearly show that the legislative body has very little exposure, knowledge, and uh, interest in, 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 in cutting edge or bleeding cutting edge technologies. And uh, um, uh, most of their information uh, comes from what we see in the media, which is not always, um, I would say, accurate or, uh, uh, or, or transparent. Um, I will, however, say that as a framework in general, that will open the conversation to the rest of the panelists, and perhaps at, when we talk about the value of financial transparency, that most of the laws in the U.S. are around security and privacy, which of course are issues, and a lot of those technologies solve the problems of security and privacy. However, none speak of ownership. And I think that really where the US has an opportunity to improve itself is out of you know, the 50 states, 49, and with the uh, uh, um, uh, exemption of, of, of uh, uh, New Hampshire, the data does not belong to the individual. And so we don't own our information and all the laws and all the pricing of the data information are based on a paper-based PDF kind of pricing. Mm -hmm. So if we really want to move forward, we have to start to have a serious conversation of data ownership, which follows property laws. 
And that's very interesting because property and there are very robust laws in this country can be owned, can be rented, can be leased, can be uh, given, can be put in a trust. So there's a whole new uh, uh, opportunity to create new realities if the legislative body would engage and to stop thinking of these minor optimization improvements. Oh, instead of 60 days, let's do it 30 days, but actually look at a different legislative framework. Stephanie, would, what are you saying changes from your perspective related to the regulatory? Well, I was just going to comment that um, I'm not sure if anyone saw maybe a few weeks ago that the FDA issued um, notification that they were looking at, it, it was the, um, the Oncology Center of Excellence, I believe, it was looking at the data that's been submitted um, as part of an NDA to look at the data that's flagged that was been that's been collected remotely versus the data that's been collected um, in an in-practice setting, and to see if there are any variations or differences in that data set, um, and almost treating it as a as an experiment, if you will, to validate the techniques and approaches of decentralized trials. So um, I'm not sure if anyone um, had any thoughts around that, but that was recent um, information that the FDA has issued. Interesting. And, and Kevin and Gabe, uh, what do you guys see? Do you see more, more hurdles or how, how are things changing from a CRO perspective? Well, I, uh, uh, I, you know, I'll just say um, I, I'm encouraged by uh, recently, you know, the FDA just promoted uh, new data czar, if you will, um, uh, and their um, willingness to accept um, uh, and, and utilize different types of technologies to support registration packets has been um, much more um, uh, much more progressive than it has been over the last year than it has been in the last decade. So I think that, that's super encouraging. Um, you know, with um, uh, uh, regards to here, I, I think it, it's still it's going to take some time. It took over a decade for the FDA to get comfortable with hybrid monitoring, um, even though there was um, a, you know, great cases for it um, in the neurocognitive areas and oncology was really driving that. <coughs> Excuse me, it still took quite a bit of time. Um, but I think now that we've got um, the driver here, things, things really have changed. I, I'm not just saying that, um, uh, you know, with, with regards to COVID and, and what uh, COVID has done, um, you know, for, uh, I guess, for change in our industry, it's probably been the biggest change driver of any, um, any event that's ever happened to us. Um, we see the med tech industry, they've been doing this for a long time. There's a company uh, here locally in Houston, Galen Data. Uh, they've been collecting um, uh, information from medical devices and make you know, fig figuring out a way to store that information and keep it yet um, uh, secure uh, from in a cyber secure way. And now you can take that data and repurpose it through federated APIs and, and utilize that information. Um, and so those types of organizations that were thinking about it before COVID are going to have a great advantage after COVID for sure. Yeah, that, that definitely speaks to the value of interoperability and being able to exchange data across platforms in a secure way, for sure. And this, this made me think of something else as well, this sort of in the regulatory vein. And one of the advantages of software like BlockCube um, or platforms like BlockCube is, is uh, the, the ability to better manage consents. Um, does anybody have any, any comment on that? But BlockCube happens to have geotagged smart consents with very advanced con, you know, controls. And, and I was wondering if, if, if that is, seems to be a movement in the industry as well. Yeah, I mean, I would say from a patient uh, standpoint, if we can start you know, remotely consenting patients, right? That's one of the big things is you usually have to have a, you know, a, you know, a wet signature and everything to verify that it's them and you have to sit down and have a whole conversation that 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 necessitates a visit. It also necessitates a uh, you know a transfer, right? So if you're at an event or you're somewhere where you you know can recruit a patient, and if you could actually recruit them on the spot and have them do consent right there, it's a, it's a huge savings and also just a huge recruitment tool. Um, one thing I just wanted to point out in the last uh, before you know, I'll give it back to the floor about the consents is 
is don't forget, forget everything else that COVID's taught us is look how fast we got those vaccines approved, mm -hmm. right? So every disease is now looking at that saying, how can, you know, we understand there was a pandemic and, and that it, we know that it won't be that way for all drugs, but if they can approve, not just approve, but if they can be developed and approved that fast, then, you know, certainly the FDA could be approving other drugs or at least getting through the, or at least denying them. But the point is, you know, judging the, the drugs or, or, you know, either favorably, unfavorably in a much quicker fashion. So I think that's really also going to be a big, big push, the fact that the vaccines came out so quickly. Absolutely. Yeah. However, yeah, so, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. However, you know, I'm glad that Gabe, Gabe brought that up because I want to kind of have a, a, maybe in the next few minutes, a little bit more of a nuanced conversation of that feat because, and this also goes back to uh, the features that we see that you mentioned, the dynamic consent uh, in, in Block you, but also the conversation we had on legislation. Um, this is really a, 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 a uh, conversation about centralization versus decentralization. And there are pros and cons to each model. So centralization gives, you know, you can do things quickly and you have standardized taxonomy and you have this kind of uh, uh, um, interoperability, which can be forced. And so that's why something like DITRA is so important because, you know, we're creating a consortium of, of folks that are gonna come in and, and, and work on that taxonomy. But let us not be uh, uh, you know, uh, misty-eyed about what happened here with the vaccine, okay? It has been brought upon us in extraordinary speed where the US bought it uh, 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 at premium with tax dollars, with clear winners and losers in the field, and they are not shared equitably with the rest of the world to the point that at least here in New York, at the end of the day, you go next to pharmacies, there are actually pharmacies that throw out in the garbage, whatever uh, vaccines are left. While I know that there are people in other places in the world that want and need these uh, 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 um, uh, vaccines. And this is not about morality. This is about a business model that doesn't allow this type of data sharing where we can streamline. So it's exactly the same thing, just as much as we didn't know how many ventilators and how much toilet paper we needed in New York. Now we don't know how many vaccinations we need. So until we fundamentally rethink the business model that is behind it, and again, what are the advantages of a decentralized system? In centralized systems, it is a honeypot and that data can be hacked that data can be lost, can be used, can be abused. They can be censored. We have no, we have seen states who have censored their data to look better. We have seen in previous in the previous administration where data has been morphed into a, in, for, for reasons that are other than scientific. So I, I don't want to discount, of course, the success that Gabe spoke to, but I just want us to um, be very attentive that the current model where there's a lot of friction a lot of capital leakage and there's no equitable distribution, that is something that if we don't take care of, then COVID-20, 21, 22, this will not work. And uh, uh, um, I'm mentioning this specifically because there's a question that is going you know, in the, in the Q and A's of how decentralized trials will look like. Mm -hmm. And that's what decentralized trials like BlockCube and others, solve. And that's what an organization like Stephanie's uh, is, is, is going to address. So I just wanted to, to make that a bit clearer to the audience. Thank you. And I, and I think that really does bring us to the point of transparency, uh, you know, being able to see data across multiple sites, but not just clinical or operational data, but financial data, how, how and how uh, the changing times as well as the changing technologies are impacting financial aspects and resource management. Can, can we just go around the room on that and maybe, maybe start with Gabe and have everybody say a few things about uh, what the financial implications? Uh, sure, I mean, I, I think I'm probably least suited to speak about this from the, from the larger standpoint, you know, the financial implications uh, for, you know, for sites, as I mentioned before, could be, um, significant if, if a lot of work is taken away from them, so to speak. Uh, so I think that's a little bit of a danger we have to make sure that we're, we're sensitive to. Um, you know, as far as the more global, I'll let someone else answer, it's not really my uh, expertise. Yeah, yeah. I, 
I'm chomping at the bed on this one. Uh, <laughs> love to jump in here. Uh, th this is the th this is the problem that never gets any um, uh, that never gets any attention um, because it's not sexy. It's not really necessarily thought of as driving you know the clinical trials process or the research progress. But it is one of the biggest messes around is the reconciliation of the financial piece um, after a trial is done. Um, I've been involved with dozens and dozens of clinical trials that have taken longer to reconcile financially than they took to actually get them up and running and executed. Um, it, it ends up uh, uh, leaving a, a, a bad taste in everyone's mouth and the company that's trying to get their product to market and the CRO, if there's a CRO involved, um, uh, you know, in their mouth. And then the sites that have put it so much hard work into getting this uh, a trial done. Um, but again, without unified technology, without centralized data sharing and uh, without um, more harmonized processes, um, you're still left with people, you know, writing stuff down on a piece of paper or Excel spreadsheets. And um, there's no real way to, to sort of reconcile that until, until now, as you start to take these more advanced concepts like blockchain and others to figure out a way to make that reconciliation in more real time. And then you know, allow those payments to flow through, um, it will speed things up. It will allow a trial to get closed much faster, um, you know, months, uh, if not, you know, maybe a half of year faster. That's incredibly important. And it also um, will allow, um, again, the sites where a lot of these patient-centered trials are, 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 are happening, it allow them to get paid quicker except the next trial. So this is probably the thing that I get most excited about. It's the least sexiest thing, but it's the one that really motivates me is because I want the trials to finish up. I want uh, the sites to get paid incredibly quickly. Um, I want all those things to happen in, in a very transparent way um, because I really don't, you know, again, as far as my business, that's something that I don't bill for. If it takes me six months to do it, it's six months of my time to, to do the financial reconciliation. That's not anything you put in a proposal and say, well, hey, um, pharma company or biotech, you know, I know it's gonna take me six months to, to do the reconciliation and you're just gonna have to pay. For it. No, that's not the way it works. It's just the cost of doing business and it's the thing that I have to deal with. So um, I'm looking for any and all technology uh, uh, improvements to help me with that process. Um, and that's, that's why I got to start talking to Rama and, the, uh, and, and Block Cube and why it's, it's been so interesting to me. Absolutely. I, I would like to add, um, and, and I really appreciate, you know, Kevin's uh, um, a thoughtful response. I think that the answer from a technology perspective has two layers to it. One is the optimization of a cur the current model. How do you, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, make it more seamless or frictionless? How do you shorten the the the, the cycles of uh, be it be it uh, procurement of data and an analysis of data, uh, and how do you make it as close as possible in real time? As well as the revenue cycle management comes around it. But I do want to. Um, uh, give an example to the audience of how it's going on, for example, in, in East Africa, in, in, in Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Burundi, and Rwanda, um, by using a self-sovereign electronic health record where you own the data and you have it on your phone, you carry your information with you and you can have it on, on uh, you know, daily diaries that you fill, and it could be the proper electronic health record that represents the meeting that you had with your healthcare professional. More importantly, uh, embedded in it are incentives like Gabe alluded to before, where for example, if I take my vaccination, if I social distance, if I adhere to a treatment, if I adhere to a certain protocol, I will receive in return both monetary and non-monetary rewards. And so if I answer, for example, a survey and that survey is pushed to me with an AI engine that is specific to my condition, you can understand that now we're creating economic activity that currently doesn't exist in our system. 
So as much as I want to contribute to things of saying, okay, let's make it cheaper, faster, better, that's fine. We need to be a little bit more imaginative on how do we really recruit patients into this? Because one of the things that are lacking in, in, in what I call obese economies. I don't like the develop developing, you know, it's like what we're developed, so we're fine. Well, everybody's in developing, but there are obese economies and lean economies. We are obese economy, okay? What we suffer is not from COVID, what we suffer is from affluenza. <laughs> and, so, and so in this uh, 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 um, obese economy, we don't care about all that leakage. We don't care, we're not inconvenienced by all this, you know, not functioning until we are. Whereas if you just make a dollar a day, 20 cents taken from you or 20 cents given to you makes a lot of difference. And so if we're able now to think through solutions like BlockCube and others, that we have the optimization part, you mentioned the geotagging, the real time financial uh, 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 module, that's all cool, but we have to have the stakeholders have to have, for the reason of a better business, in the back of their mind, how do I create a peer-to-peer -peer relationship with the uh, uh, users, with the patients that I consent to be right. part of that economic activity? Very interesting. Uh, yes, and Stephanie, I saw that you, you want to make a comment as well. Yeah, I was, I, well, first of all, I think everyone here has captured essentially how important this is, but I think at the end of the day too, it's also important um, to think about what this all translates to and it's better engagement for the patient and for the site too. And I think at the end of the day, if we're ultimately trying to deliver trials more effectively and accelerating them, we need to have that level of engagement. So nothing else to add. That was, I think you guys nailed it on the head. <laughs> While I have you, you know, knowing that you are involved in pro procurement and procuring these emerging technologies, where do you see, where do you advise people to go? Where do you see, where do you see uh, technology going and, and what advice would you give to CROs about what kind of technologies that they should procure. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. It's a good question. So um, first of all, I always like to say everything is on the table, right? So we don't know what we don't know yet. So it's important to keep an open mind and evaluating solutions because ultimately sponsors, you know, such as BMS, Pfizer, GSK, we are not the ones inventing anything. We are relying on our, you know, the workspace to really invent for us and we're implementing, right, with support. Um, but as I think about you know, the next few years, rem anything that touches a remote monitoring environment is key, whether that's sensors, whether that's um, medication intake, you know, it, it, I mean, the list is really endless. It really depends on the uh, indications that you're going after. I think that's where our minds will be going um, in the immediate term, just to tr as we try to think about getting tidbits of information into a patient and their lifestyle in a remote setting. I think that will be one of the core areas that we'll have to look at and focus on. Very interesting. So does anybody else have any sort of, of last thoughts on where, where the industry is going? I, I think most of you have, have weighed in on that, but. Well, I, I would like then to turn it over. Um, well, first let's, let's just kind of wrap up. This is some thoughts that I had had prior to to the conference on um, some of the requirements. And I think we've, all, we've talked about all of these things about the need for remote setup, remote data collection and management, um, geotagging of data with real-time aggregation across multiple sites, um, really focusing on the data integrity now that data is being collected in new ways and new places and the security of that data um, and, and the benefits that come with smart contracts in an accurate picture of your finances and your resources as, as they, they're consumed. I think, I think all of those things are very important and have been brought to our attention today by each of your roles. Um, let's, let's, let's take it over to Rama then. Rama, do you wanna kind of wrap up with just a minute more about, about BlockCube and how they meet these needs and a little bit about your decentralized trial pioneer program? Yeah, uh, thanks, Kristen. Uh, this has been very um, amazingly refreshing and. Uh, the viewpoints presented by everybody over here. So BlockCube is one of the uh, earliest, the pioneers in this area. And we've looked at decentralized trials 
uh, not as the destination, but part of the journey. And similarly, we have looked at decentralized technologies like distributed ledger as creating a foundation for not just leapfrogging, but being the rocket ship to the future in terms of drug development, as well as moving trials faster from the sites to let's say the patient. I think the other part I'd like to just tee off on is our whole approach over here has been to take a look at and give people one single source of truth in a unified platform with multiple capabilities, delivering benefits which are very specific, whether it is uh, you know, a rare disease program, whether it is a CRO or anything of that sort. And keeping in mind our leadership role, we've created a Pioneers launch program where if you'll contact us separately, we will be willing to partner with you in pilots that will demonstrate clearly and visibly the return on investment that you can get with this process. And not only really is that tactical advantage there because we recognize we've got to uh, convince the CFOs, the CIOs, in addition to the CSOs, the CMOs, et cetera, those are some of the personnel here. But in addition, what we want to do is to lay a foundation for you, exactly as Alex described it, in terms of making it not just the decentralized trials of 2020 or 2021, but hopefully be the decentralized trials of 2030, when the patient becomes far more the center of every operation. And whether it is for a sponsor or whether it is for a CRO, uh, we want to make the inefficiencies a lot easier to use. So thank you for this opportunity. Wonderful. Well, and I personally want to thank each of you on behalf of BlockCube and Green Room Technologies. Thank you all for joining us today. We really appreciate each of your perspective and the interaction between you. And for those of you in the audience, please do reach out to us if you want to learn more uh, about any of these topics and, um, and about the uh, BlockCube uh, solution. So please reach out and, and thanks to everyone.